Okay, welcome back. So today we're going to be talking about some tools that we can use to visualize some of our probabilities here. Okay, so these main tools are going to be contingency tables, tree diagrams, and Venn diagrams. All right, so some of this stuff you, you may have seen before. Probably a tree diagram and a, and a Venn diagram. But let's start here with contingency tables. Okay, so contingency tables are useful in there. They're basically just an extension of a frequency table to two variables. Okay, so when we're looking for, for compound events, looking for probabilities here, they're, they're very, very useful. Okay, so remember back to some of our, some of our terminology. Um, if we have multiple variables, often we call them factors, and certain values of those variables we call levels. Okay, so the way we organize a table, a two-way table, whatever our, our row variable is, we usually say it has R levels. Whatever our column variable is, we might say it has C levels. Right, so we classify our, our table as an R times C table. Okay, but that's one thing to remember whenever you're working with contingency tables, usually you, the rows are mentioned first. All right, R times C table. So let's look at an example of what that might look like. All right, so we have some, some survey results here on students, and their smoking habits, right, and compared to their parents' smoking habits. Okay, so either they have two parents that smoke, one parent that smokes, or no parents that smoke, and they themselves either smoke, yes or no. Okay, so there's two factors here. One factor has three levels, one, two, three. The other factor has two levels. In this case, we would have a three by two table. All right, just because we called the parents' smoking status, the, the row variable, and the students, the column variable. Now, it doesn't really matter which one we call which, uh, but we just, we just went with this order here. So our results would look something like this. All right, so we've got two variables, and we have, so what can we use this for? All right, well, the first thing that jumps out at us here are what's called joint probabilities. Okay, so joint probabilities in the language of probability right, is just these two variables or these two events intersections. Okay, so remember our, our example, say we wanted to find the joint probability of a student smoking and both parents smoking. Okay, well the first step we got to do find our total number of people in our study here. We've got about f over 5,000, so really good sized study. All right, and we're going to find this joint probability on the table. So we could call a student smoking, call that event S. At both of their parents smoking, call that event B. So really what we're looking for here is the intersection of S and B. Right? And that is super easy to find in a contingency table. Okay, that's right here. So there's 400 students out of the over 5,000 that have both of these qualities. Right? So our joint probability is about 0 0.0744 or if we want to put it as a percentage. So joint probabilities are probably one of the, the first things that jumps out to us from a contingency table. All right, but if we do a little bit more work and we add on to these tables, the first thing that we can add here, that we can expand from this table, is called the marginal distribution. All right, so essentially what your marginal distribution here is your row and column totals. Okay. So here we're representing our marginal distribution with frequencies. And I suppose they call it the marginal distribution because you know what we have in black here is what you started with, right? And then you're you're summing up your totals, your column and row totals out here in the margins. Okay. So we can also express our marginal distributions as relative frequencies rather than just frequencies. So let's look at how we get there. So my frequencies, my marginal frequencies are in blue here. Okay, my marginal relative frequencies are in green. So how did I get from blue to green? 
Right? Well, for example, if we wanted to go from our, we've got a marginal frequency of 1,000 students that smoke. So how did I get this 18.6%? Just divide by the total. All right, so use that, that 5,000 number in my denominator there. All right, so marginal distribution is pretty easy to find. Um, often expressed as relative frequencies, and they can give us some insight here, right? Like, well, it looks like definitely the majority, over 80% of students don't smoke, okay? but it does look like they came from parents where a lot of them had, at the very least, a single parent smoking, right? If we add up both of these, right, that's over 70% of people had at least one parent smoking. All right, so we can take some insights from marginal distribution. The next kind of distribution that really gives us some insight is our conditional distribution. All right, we've defined conditional probabilities. I might be interested in the conditional distribution when I think that one of the factors may be affecting the, the other, or at least one level of factors may have an effect on the other. Okay, so this can really shed some light on what we're looking for here. Okay, remember the idea of a conditional probability or conditional distribution. We're, we're basically reducing our denominator, right? We're, we're reducing the pool. We're conditioning on a certain factor of a variable to reduce our sample space, okay, to kind of pare things down. So for our example, of course, probably one of the more obvious questions would be something along the lines of does a student's parent smoking habit have an effect on their smoking habits okay so what if we condition okay, what if I condition on parent smoking habits and look at students that do smoke okay so we'll take one of these for example so the purple here are our conditional probabilities. And let's take one of these purple conditional probabilities, for example. All right, we're gonna, we're gonna look at this one. So this is the conditional probability that given both of a student's parents smoking, what's the probability they smoke? We're denoting that by given B, that's both, what's the probability they smoke? All right, remember, and it does, it does have to come in this order. Okay, so to find this, I can put the marginal frequency in the denominator. So remember, instead of dividing by the entire sample space, right, we're conditioning on a certain level of that factor. Right? So we're conditioning on the factor here of parent smoking status. To find this specific one, I divide by the marginal where both parents smoke, and my numerator is that joint probability, right? It's that intersection. So my conditional probability, given both parents smoke, what's the probability that a student smokes is about 22.47%, right? So we could interpret that as a little over 20% of the time, if both of their parents smoke, that student will end up smoking. Okay, we could also condition on another variable. Right? So what if you wanted to condition on students' habits? So going the other way with it. Right? Oftentimes when we have two factors, it may be a, a chicken and egg type situation. Right? We're not sure. Well, yes, there's there may be something going on here, right? but we're not sure which is actually causing the other. So what if we condition the other way? For example, what if I wanted to find one specific probability here? Given the student doesn't smoke, what's the probability both parents smoke? So again, I'm reducing my denominator by using those marginal frequencies here. Okay, so given they do not smoke, marginal frequency there, and the joint on top in my numerator, the probability both parents smoking given a student does not smoke is about 30 percent okay so marginal distributions can be interesting conditional distributions even more interesting 
Okay, and we can draw some conclusions from contingency tables. But we also have to be a little bit careful with contingency tables because of this thing called Simpson's paradox. All right, Simpson's paradox is a look at how confounding or lurking variables, all right, we've, we've talked about those before, it's a look at how they can have an effect on contingency tables. And Simpson's paradox shows us that often what we'll find is if we do have the presence of a lurking variable or some sort of hidden factor at play, if we condition on this factor, the results that we get look much, much different from the original raw data. All right, and we'll look at an example here. Okay, so I'll let you read this and kind of get a feel for what we're looking at here. Okay, so we've got two different approaches at removing kidney stones. We've got the traditional kind of open surgery versus a new, less invasive technique called PCNL. Okay, so what we're seeing here, we've got the percentage of failures of each of them, right? So if you, we, we want our percentage of failure to be lower, right? And we see overall the lower percent of failure is this PCNL, right? So maybe you're thinking, okay, wait, this PCNL, it's minimally invasive and you have a lower risk of failure. Why would we ever want to do the, the open surgery? What, what's the point? So do we actually get better results with that? Well, with this example, our groups, the people who get each of these surgeries, are not completely randomly chosen. Okay, turns out, if you know anything about these, um, these procedures, turns out that less invasive version, the PCNL, is typically prescribed for small kidney stones, situations where there won't be many co complications. The open surgery is reserved for situations where the kidney stones larger or their complications might arise. Okay, so what if we condition on the size of the stone? So for small kidney stones, looks like we have a lot more PCNL surgeries prescribed and done here, right, for small stones, but we see a higher percentage of failure. So that's interesting. What about for large stones? Well, they still did some PCNL for large stones, but majority for large stones were open surgery. And PCNL still has a higher failure rate. So this is why it's called a paradox. Right? Remember our original results here. Overall, with the raw data, the failure percentage for PCNL was lower. But when we look at the data here, when we condition on kidney stone, PCNL has actually a higher failure rate in both cases. All right, so this is why it's called a paradox. It's just, it's just a very strange situation, and it can pop up a lot when there's some sort of confounding factor or some sort of, some sort of lurking variable going on there. And oftentimes, it's caused in situations where you're not randomly assigned to groups and we have large sample size disparity. Okay, so just something we got to be careful about with contingency tables. Okay, so let's take a look at tree diagrams now. So where do tree diagrams help? Well, they if we got a situation where we need to quantify our number of outcomes in our sample space or kind of visualize or picture our sample space, they can be very helpful. They also can help us kind of view these ideas of conditional probability. So let's, let's think about an example where we might use something like this. All right, so say you decide you want to have three kids and you want to know what are, what are all the possible combinations of genders here. All right, so you may be able to think about this sample space in your head. Some people just have a kind of gift for visualizing situations like that. Um, the obvious ones, you know, are okay, we could have three boys, we could have three girls. 
But then you get to questions like, okay, boy, boy, girl versus boy, girl, boy. Where are these are these different? Are these distinct outcomes? And and yes, I would call those distinct different outcomes. Okay, so maybe you can picture all those and get an idea how, how many are there total. But an easy way to count that up is just draw a tree diagram like this. So it turns out you could count the number of outcomes there, or you could use a nice simple little formula here. There are two possible outcomes, boy or girl, three kids. Two to the third gives us eight. Okay, so oftentimes this number in the number of items in our sample space is what we're after and you may just be able to use that nice little formula there but being able to picture the whole sample space is nice alright another tool that helps us are Venn diagrams okay so I'm sure you've seen a Venn diagram before I want to use a Venn diagram here to kind of picture some of these probability terms that we've talked about already Okay, so what does our complement look like in a Venn diagram? Well, if this entire square here is our sample space, okay, and the event we're interested in, event A, right, the probability of event A could be represented by all the outcomes included in that yellow circle there. Okay, our complement then is everything in the sample space, not in A. It's that pink area. Okay, so the complement is a pretty pretty easy conceptual idea, but visually, that's what the complement looks like. What about two mutually exclusive events? What does the Venn diagram of two mutually exclusive events look like? Okay, well that would be not a very exciting Venn diagram there, right? This is just a Venn diagram where they're two separate circles, no overlap. Right, so if I want to visualize the probability of A here, that's the pink area. If I want to visualize the probability of B, that's the blue area. All right, notice we have no overlap. That overlapping area is our intersection. Those are common outcomes. Okay, so making sense of, remember back to our third axiom of probability, it said something along these lines there is no intersection between two mutually exclusive events in other words common outcomes are the null set there's nothing there okay what if what about a Venn diagram two events that are not mutually exclusive right, that's where we do have some kind of overlap and we can picture that intersection as kind of that orange football shaped area in the middle there okay what if we now want to find our probability of just a single event A Right, well, that is the pink area, but not just the pink area, because our pink area cuts off right here. Okay, so our probability of A, or all the outcomes in A, is everything that's in A or not B, that's what the pink represents, plus the intersection. Right, what if we want to find our probability of B? Well, that's in everything in that yellow section, that's B not in A, plus their intersection. Okay, so we'll use some Venn diagrams, some of these ideas to assign probabilities in the future as well. But those are some, some key tools that we use to find to visualize probabilities, contingency tables, tree diagrams, and Venn diagrams. We'll see some more examples of this in the future. Thanks for tuning in, and we'll see you.